All right, welcome to Speaking from User Experience. I'm your host, Philippe Charles, and we are here once again with Darren Staten and Steve Maxson. Uh, Steve is our senior UX UI designer. Um, he believes that UX design has the power to influence lives and behaviors in significant ways. And Darren is our lead UX UI designer, and he is passionate about solving problems through clean, minimal design. And we are here today, last time we talked about designing for accessibility, today we're talking about how to build a UX culture within your company, organization, your, could be your school, your wherever, right? How do you build a UX culture? So let's get right into it. The first question I have is, what is a UX culture? How do you know it when you see it? Mm, it's a very, very loaded uh, question there. Um, but for me and I, I speak for me, to me, a UX culture is uh, what I call or what most people call, I think it's just, it's just design thinking, right? It's a way of thinking. It means everyone at the company is thinking from a human-centered approach, right? Uh, everyone's challenging ideas. Everyone's championing each other's input. Um, and it's also your client too, right? Your client uh, becomes an extension of your team. It's like at some companies, like, you know, you might, you write up the contract, um, you get the work and then you don't talk to them again till later, right? That, that's, to me, you're, you're not really in a UX culture there, right? It's when the client and you have an open communication, you're talking back and forth, they're giving input, they're giving feedback. Um, that, that's part of that culture, right? So um, basically just meaning you have a close and open communication with the client. You know, everyone is willing to adapt and go with change. Uh, and I think if you see all those happening at a company, then you know you have a great UX culture. Yeah, I think like, um, you know, one of the things you talked about is like, is like, is uh, everyone, er everyone's doing it at the company. Um, because yeah, that was one of the things, like when I think of like grievances that I see as far as like, uh, like bad signs of a, a, of the, of a UX culture or things that are missing is when you don't apply uh, a UX process to every project. Um, you, you, you basically, there's companies that are out there and they pick and choose where to apply, uh, UX and where, where they're just going to skip it because they feel it's not needed. And I, I think that's one of the things when you're looking for a, a good UX culture is that you're applying it everywhere. Um, and I think that just results in, uh, it's going to result in higher quality product. And it's also going to be, you know, what other, what, you know, that's what designers are looking for. Uh, if you look at it from through that lens. Uh, an another thing too is uh, uh, as far as like how you look at or how, how you see it is like when you're looking at like big companies, big enterprises, uh, it's, this is especially a problem, but how siloed is that company? Uh, because like you might be, you know, if you're, if you're a designer and you're, you're looking at it from that perspective, you might, the UX team, like typically there's two ways that it's organized in an enterprise level it's either embedded or uh, it's, uh, it's external. It's like, it's kind of its, its own department um, that then like, you know, works with other uh, de uh, development teams. And, uh, but there, there's also too, like those dev teams, are they talking to each other? A lot of times, like you, you have all these things that are going on, but no one's really talking to each other because like each one of these different departments, each, each of these dev or product teams, they're completely siloed. And, and that creates a lot of problems, no matter how the UX team is structured. Uh, so that's another, that's another big thing. And I, I think it's too, it's something where it's not something you can just go in and, and observe for a day and be able to say like, is this a good UX culture or not? If you, like I said earlier, my first example, it's like, how, how often is it used? Is it used for every project? Are you picking and choosing? But if you are, if you are like a designer and you're going in for an interview or if you're trying to get like a quick answer to determine the UX culture of a business, ask them if they have a design system. And uh, this is for like enterprises, right? Maybe not necessarily for agencies, but ask them if they have a design system. If they say no, run, uh, because that's a red flag immediately. Uh, if, if they say yes, then just ask a follow-up question then of like, how is it used by every product team? And then if you get some sort of hesitation or some sort of uh, indication that that is not the case, that's a red flag. And that's how you can find out uh, pretty quickly if you're on the outside of a company or you're just trying, you're trying to get, you sink your, your teeth in there. That's like the quick way that I would go about doing it. That, I think that would give me the information I need. 
Yeah, and it's not just to clarify, it's not, uh, at least from my perspective, it's not just the designers or uh, the product people owning the project, right? It's also the project managers or anyone that's part of their project in that way um, on that side. Because at a small company, right, you might be like a dev, like just a dev company or a company that just has a UX team development. But you could be a larger company where like part of that is also the marketing is involved, right? The marketing team may be involved. So that's everyone who's touching that product is thinking in that way. Um, and that's I think it's more about thinking. If everyone has that thought process, then you're in a good route. Yeah. And um, so one of the questions uh, like, that came up sort of as you all were speaking is we're obviously looking at this through the lens of sort of product development and, um, and certainly like, you know, the supporting roles, <coughs> right? You said, mentioned project managers, even marketers, right? But is it only like product development or software development companies, like, like can a hospital have a design thinking or a, a, a UX kind of minded um, kind of construction company? Like, is it mainly like, like when we're thinking of soc software and product development or can it be bigger than that? Well, the funny part is it, the, the, the idea of thinking was around before software and tech. So I would say, yes, it can. Um, I just think over time, you know, designers, engineers, uh, anyone who is operating in a design type uh, atmosphere, right, should or you should utilize design thinking, right? Because the whole purpose is to foster a creative environment where design is important from whatever level it is. Uh, so hospitals, right, is and actually they have design teams, right? There are UX teams there. Uh, there are development um, companies and stuff like that um, from that at, um, from that perspective. So uh, it's, it's every company. It's just, it's just a creative way of thinking to solve problems, right? That means whatever your problem that you're solving is, it's going to be instinctive and functional uh, uh, by the end of it. And you're putting your user, right? It's empathy involved. Uh, so all that is, can be done in any type of company for whatever product you're making. Yeah, I, I think the most common role that's similar to UX design uh, in a more physical environment is a industrial designer. Um, and that's where you, you see those, especially in the medical field when it comes to, you know, how do you get, you know, the, the masks and stuff like that, um, that might be for, you know, assisting breathing and things like that. There, there's a lot, there's a lot of similarities because they have to go through uh, like a prototyping stage and, and everything. And they follow a lot of the same principles. So, uh, the same, the same, like that's where Darren was talking about. A lot of the disciplines that are part of you, the you know, UX today, a lot of that I think comes or is it goes with industrial design as well. So, yeah, you can factor it in. It doesn't have to necessarily be for software development. And sometimes those disciplines, like the line can blur a little bit because sometimes mm -hmm. you have to have software that has to work with like some sort of physical equipment. So, think about like cars or um, other machinery, uh, you know, that has uh, physical controls. A lot, oftentimes, you, you, like, it would be very good to have it so that the UX designer needs to be familiar or working with the industrial designer and making sure that they understand how everything's going to work because, you know, the input devices and everything is going to factor greatly into how the software that might be utilized in a vehicle, um, how it's going to be, uh, how that's going to be used by the end user and the designer, in both cases, need to know how that is going to work. Yeah, and I think Steve hit it right on the head. Because in one of my previous positions, I was working with all mechanical engineers um, for most of the time. And it had to be married, right? So everyone had to work on it. We were working with physical machines that had software in them. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think Steve hit it right on the head. Yeah, and I think about, like, uh, Steve, you wrote a blog post about um, UX um, earlier this year, I think it was. And you, you liken something to like space design where like you have your, like inside a house, for example, architectural design where um, you have a, a kitchen that's near a dining room because of how you would, would use those two kind of together and right, uh, right. So um, I would imagine like even like as the hospital, right, like even the layout of the place is, can follow, a, a, you know, a UX approach to how um, it's executed and how, you know, it, it, it serves the, the doctors, the nurses, the patients, of course. Um, so yeah, that makes a lot of sense. All right, I'll get back to my actual questions that I had planned, but that just, that, 
that made me think of that. Um, so, okay, who, who at an organization then is responsible for building a UX culture? Ooh, uh, well, I have my own term for that. I, I think other people call it different things. Uh, I think what I have came up with for it, probably I didn't come up with it, who knows, but design allies, right? I think is what I'm calling it. Uh, and what that means is anybody, right? Is those who have the knowledge and expertise as a company is the people that are in charge of that. So uh, for instance, that can depend on the company, like we talked about earlier, it can depend on the size and how it's structured, like Steve was talking about with larger companies, uh, where it's external, internal team, or if they have team leads versus team managers and stuff like that. Um, but it's, it's really anyone who has that uh, skill set, right? And they're the, they're the gatekeepers, uh, so to speak. Um, it could be the C-suite executives, the CEO, CXO, whoever. Um, but it's whoever has that knowledge and them coming together to share that knowledge. So, uh, for instance, at our company, it's me and Steve, right? Um, and, and you. Uh, we have that knowledge and we share with our, comp uh, uh, you know, our boss, our CEO, who also has that knowledge. And we're the, the people who help uh, foster that environment here. So uh, in another company, it could be someone completely different. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's accurate. And I think I'd also say that um, one thing that is really important, especially in like the you know, large enterprises. Again, I'm, I'm trying to think about this like outside of like an agency role, like outside of like Crosscom, so that it's more applicable to a greater number of people. But you really need like the executive team to to buy into it and and enforce it uh, essentially, because um, oftentimes like you can you can have like the best UX designers, you can have the best UX researchers, but it doesn't mean anything if the work that they do is passed off to these uh, product teams and then essentially viewed as a suggestion, a suggestion that they can ignore. Uh, because that happens a lot. I, I'll, I'll, I'll put it that way. It happens a lot where it's viewed that way. And, and then, and then the, when you get a chance as a designer to view the, the product that's developed, um, and, and you see like, oh, this isn't what I designed at all. Um, you can imagine the, the frustration, regardless of what, what walk of life you find yourself in. If you're doing something, whatever you do for your job, if you do something and then you find out that all that work that you did, all that time that you spent on something was essentially ignored and, and uh, that doesn't feel great, right? And so, I think that is like that's hurting like the the the, the culture there, um, and, and then it's like at that point it's like you know a lot of uh, we talked about this in the in the last podcast, but UX is still like a big thing that uh, a lot of companies are trying to get, and they they they're, they're go they go to these conferences they're told you need UX in your in your company um, you need to embrace it, but uh, they they like and so like you you hire these these companies hire these UX designers they might be very talented. But then, like then, like they, they, you don't see the fruits of their labor because the their, the the work that they do is not followed through on on the development side. And I guess that, that like that's the other thing too, um, as far as like who's building the, the UX culture. Because I'm not trying to like to throw stones at uh, product teams, product managers, developers, whatever the case may be in in, in your company. Um, but you know, it ties into the other thing where it's just like everyone needs to like work together as a team. Um, and that's where like, you know, what Darren was saying with like allies and it's like, it, it really is everyone. Uh, a lot of times in, in places that have a very bad culture, it's viewed as a us versus them type of environment, you know, where uh, you don't see, you, 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 there's like a competitive type of thing. And this goes with what I was talking about with silos earlier too, is sometimes like the developers or sometimes like the, product owners of, of certain, uh, uh, in some, in some software, they, they see, they have a vision in their head of what they want that to be. And they will do, they will move mountains to ensure that their vision comes to fruition. But when you have UX designers, UX researchers, they come to the table, they bring the research, they bring the data that says the vision that the product owner has isn't actually what users want then that's where you have you run into unique uh, certain you know in, interesting situations and sometimes you get that us versus them um and 
but you know ultimately it comes down to like what Darren has been preaching about design thinking and you know thinking about the user what the user wants um, so just getting everyone on the same page which I think starts with like at the executive level and making sure that everyone you know everyone we, we're bringing in this UX team we need to actually utilize them and not treat them as something that's uh, you know maybe uh, uh, icing on top I guess or some kind of added bonus or that they're just gonna make the app look pretty like they actually are doing a lot of research a lot of data a lot of thought into the work and we need to follow through and make sure that it's being acted upon that that feels that feels very personal like like you've been you've been <laughs> in a situation where, <laughs> where you felt I, like i've been in lots of situations i am just yeah i'm trying to I'm, I'm not i'm not naming any names or anything but you know i've I, i've seen i've worked at some really good places and i've worked at some places you know where um you know there were there were some issues and uh you know you just have to that's why i try to speak and i'm trying to speak in more generalities is because like each each situation is is unique you yeah. can't just if, if you just listen to someone or you listen to you know the, the google the facebook's out there that are you know that, that might be speaking at conferences and stuff like that I, it's one thing that really bothers me is like they, they a lot of a lot of speakers they they, they could go back to like grade school english right where it's they speak and they're like, this is, this is the way, right? I noticed all my Star Wars stuff back here. This is the way. But, um, you know, it, it's like you, you need to really uh, apply it uh, and, and think about, is it best for me? Is it best for the situation that I'm in? Because your situation is probably very different than that of like, if you, if, you know, people at Facebook, Google, YouTube, some of the other like big companies, big tech companies out there that are, are speaking at a lot of these conferences. Yeah, and just to touch on that real quick, I think Steve is kind of in line. I think uh, when you're doing research, right, because uh, that's the, usually the first step people take, right, uh, to figure out um, how to define UX culture, because UX is usually added after the fact, right, to your company's already established for a lot of companies. Um, keep in mind, those companies like Google, Facebook, and all those places, like Google's helped coin, you know, right, uh, UX in a way, right? They've built the process and everyone's copying off of them. But keep in mind, because they built it, they also have way more employees than the average company. So they have UX teams where like the U our job, right? We do a lot of things, right? But they have people who do just a singular action of what we do, right? There's one person that only does research. There's one person that only writes, right? They're a UX writer. And there's one person that designs, right? But one does black and white wireframes and the other one does color. And another one only designs buttons all day. So like, there's a whole lot there and there. So it's very important that everyone there has the design thinking, right? And you have way more people who have shares that, uh, that knowledge and mindset. So just keeping that in mind when you're doing any company. Then there's another reason why it's very important that everyone who even is not a designer should be sharing in that process. You know, what's, what's interesting about what, what both of you all are saying is like we're, we're talking again about like user experience in, in terms of like building something for the outside. But there's also this element that Steve brought up and you're sort of echoing about like what happens within the company and almost like an HR, like what, what I mean by HR is like, how does this team feel about the work that they're doing and is that work being valued and that kind of thing. And I, I feel like we so, so often talk about UX in terms of ex, in ter terms of our external facing products and not necessarily our internal, um, our internal sort of ways of interacting with one another where there's like, mm -hmm. where H HR teams could, could, could think about user um, centered approaches to how everybody is, is, um, feeling about, you know, the work that they're doing and how they uh, feel about the larger, their larger point of, uh, sorry, their larger, I'm rambling now because this, this running out of time thing came up. Um, <laughs> essentially what I was saying was um, there's an HR aspect that can, can benefit from sort of design thinking as well, right? Um, how people within a company and departments within a company feel supported, feel like their work is valuable. Um, that's, that's part of another direction to, to user experience in the workplace. But um, one, thing that, one thing that I heard also was um, about like the buy-in buy from leadership. And it's sort of like every, everybody's job, but there needs to be buy-in from leadership. And I also heard Steve say something along the lines of 
um, like the not kind of sort of saying like certain things need to be enforced. And that's, a, that's really interesting because like culture is one of those sensitive things where it's like, it's part rules and part feeling, right? It's, it's, there are some things that are like, it needs to be this way. And there's another thing, there are other things that happen that need to happen organically. And thus the right environment needs to be created for those things to happen organically. So the question I have, are what are the best activities and practices um, to start fostering a UX culture? Uh, I think me and Steve may differ on this, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Steve take this one first, and then I come after. I come after. Okay, okay. Uh, but I, I think one thing that um, that is I think is really important is to have regular check-ins uh, with the between the the dev team and the the UX team. Uh, th th that would give an opportunity then for the UX team to be able to see the progress that is being made and essentially catch anything that is uh, maybe uh, differing from the designs that were created uh, while also being able to take on additional, you know, unforeseen um, things that, that come up, um, maybe little, little surprises or maybe like the, you just, they, they, the, the dev team discovers like, oh, we don't, this is like out of budget essentially to do, to do this or uh, they, you, you can, you can, uh, the UX team then is still, they're still involved in that part of the project and then they can weigh in on the best way to handle it, to produce the best user experience. But this is what I was like talking about earlier. It's like sometimes like these teams are so siloed that the UX team will complete the work and then it will shift, you know, that work then moves on over to the development team and then they, they work on it. And then sometimes the UX designers, they won't ever see it again until it's like live on the website, app, software, whatever you're working on. Uh, that's what, that's what uh, you know, I was, I'm trying to get at is that, that needs to be avoided is just, just having these check-ins. So then that way, you know, everyone, there's, there's, there's transparency both ways and you're able to see the, the progress that's being made, catch things before it's too late to fix them. Um, and, and they can be fixed before they, ideally before they get to like the QA process. Uh, so that, that's one thing. And then the, and another thing that I, that I like that we do here at Crosscom, which maybe is like going a little bit um, beyond the, the nature of this question, but I still feel it's important is, uh, you know, having like team building activities. And so, you know, here, here at Crosscom, um, you know, we, we uh, what we do is like, we all have these uh, VR headsets and it gives us an opportunity because just because of the nature of our work, we do a lot of VR and AR type work. And so just being able to experience it is, is important in demo work and things like that. And so, but we also, you know, obviously VR is also got like a lot of games out there and stuff. So and a lot of these are multiplayer based games. And so uh, give a shout out to my boy Carrington who helped like kind of spearhead <laughs> this initiative. But, uh, you know, he, he organized these team building activities for projects that we're working on where it brings in not just like, you know, me and Darren, but like he'll, he'll, he'll participate, developers will participate. And it gives us a chance to kind of like, you know, uh, work together, talk together in a fun environment while, while we're playing games. And, um, you know, we, we, we just did this the other day, actually. Um, I think Philippe and, and, and Darren, they remember, they probably had nightmares about it last night uh, <laughs> because of the stomping I put on them. Um, don't know how you win by eight strokes in a, when we only play nine holes, but I somehow did it. But Some of I us mean, had that, sore still... arms. I had a sore arm, tore a rotator cuff, you know. Look, I'm yeah, not... see, it, help, it, help, it, see it, it helps bring us together. It helps bring us together better. I feel um, division so happening have... right now, actually. <laughs> I feel like, you know, I, I thought about bringing that up at the start of this show. I, started, I thought about being like, I'm only going to uh, send questions Darren's way. I don't want to talk to Steve at all. Because <laughs> if, if I got beat, I can only assume you found a way to cheat. So, <laughs> <laughs> But see, see like, that, that's what I'm talking about, though, is just like it <laughs> makes it so that, you know, you can, have, you can joke around with people and, 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 and still have fun. Um, but like, you know, I, I, I've worked with managers before where they, they felt like that type of thing is, has no place in a work environment. And I completely vehemently disagree with that stance. Yeah. I, I feel like, you know, like there's, like, I've also like, I worked in video games too. So I've also seen it go way too far. Yeah. So like, don't, don't like, I guess, 
misinterpret what I'm saying. I think it's fine. It should be something that doesn't doesn't take a a lot of time, um, and and don't hide it under the guise of like QA or something like that, which is what they a lot of companies in the gaming space tend to do. Um, but you know, it do, it needs to be done so in a way that it doesn't interfere with your ability to get your job done. Yeah. That's like the the most important thing. Yeah. I'll let, I'll let Darren go now. I want to see what he's gonna, where he's going to steer this ship now. So it, it's funny. Part, part, part of my answer to this question, at least the way I took it, agrees with Steve, right? Or at least I, I know he's going to agree because I agree with what he said, um, as in like collaboration, right? Uh, like he mentioned, well, how we do VR here and stuff like that. But finding ways to communicate, I think, is a big tool or practice or activity that you can do, right? Um, but the, the flip side of that, so since he talked about that, I'm gonna talk about the educational side. Um, this is where I think workshops, or um, sometimes here we do lunch and learn, Shira. You know, uh, Steve is not the biggest fan of workshops and conferences, but I think this is where workshops and uh, conferences uh, can be um, very important and a handy tool, right? And I don't think it's one of those situations where you send everyone in your company every month to a workshop or stuff like that, or make them do this stuff they don't wanna do, right? But I think in general, right, uh, and this goes back to the uh, question you asked earlier with allies and things like that, right? Once having those people who want to, right, there's always going to be people who want to engage in leadership, like we talked about earlier, leadership and Zach's having those people uh, uh, part of the process, right? Those people are also the same people, I think, as good practice is people who should educate themselves in there and have a general knowledge, right? So those are the people I think should go through like empathy workshops or go through a design thinking workshops or UX workshops and learning that culture, right? The same way you would uh, if you were in Agile or learning Scrum and stuff like that. Those same things are very useful tools and I think activities or practices that help foster environment because it doesn't help just having one person right, who knows things, it, you, you, need a, you need a group consensus, right? You need multiple people who all share that same feeling and thoughts and understanding. And uh, some you can get through Google and YouTube, but also helps to really have some type of organized understanding from everyone, like we're all on the same page and we can move forward from there. So um, I think implementing workshops or having opportunities for your employees to go to conferences to learn more about it uh, is a great, uh, resource and things that I cherish and like to do myself. So um, I'd say a combination between those two. <laughs> yeah, and I'm actually going to add my my two cents in on this question um, because I think there's like a there's a middle point between like the the sort of the play and the learning, which is like the practice. And I mm -hmm. think I think like I've been fortunate enough in in past companies that I've worked with in here as well to be a part of like looking at a problem and then like going through that problem with my team and sort of going through the design thinking process. And I think it's, I think like going back to the HR thing, right? Like I think it could be really interesting for companies to start with the problems that are closest to them and go through the process of like have, have somebody on the team with who's familiar with the design thinking process sort of lead things and kind of bring the company along with them and um, that way, people have the, like, they, they see it as a problem that uh, um, is, is something that they'll, like, uh, benefit from or, or that they want to see because it's, it's in their workplace. And they'll also um, be able to see the, the whole process of, like, what the, pro what the solution looks like on the other end and what it means to have like a multidisciplinary approach from different people in your company who may be coming at the problem from a different vantage point. And then um, from being able to see that over time, even with smaller problems, I think it becomes easier to see how that same process can be beneficial with larger, um, with larger problems as well. So that, that's something that I benefited from, from actually being like doing design thinking within a company setting. Um, so that's, that's my two cents as well. But I, I, all this HR talk coming from Philippe, I think he's trying to make a career switch here. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I've I've always been interested in in I've always been in been interested as a communicator in like internal communications. So th there's an HR aspect to that, I guess. But yeah. but no, yeah. Steve, I'm not I coming. For, get, I'm not coming for Beverly's job. Word. Okay, Beverly, you're safe. That's good. <laughs> um, but uh, I got I got to get my work my my two cents in on like the whole workshop thing. I guess like uh, 
where I guess where I where I my my stance on it is I feel a lot. Of, I, I again I worked at some like very big companies where they've had like two three day workshops, and those are I feel the biggest waste of time and resources. Um, I'm not saying that they should be completely eliminated, but a lot of times I feel they are completely unnecessary, at least for the vast majority of the people that are there. Uh, I, and, and, and the other thing too is like the, the thing I really, really dislike, especially in this like this new kind of like um, remote type of age that we're living in, like post COVID is a lot of these workshops, like they, they still are like these, like when you go to these conferences and stuff, they still talk about, you know, the, the need for, for doing things in like a physical, a physical way. So you have like post-it notes that they stick on the wall and then so you need multiple different sizes of post-it notes and different colors and things like that. And I, I guess like my, my whole thing is like, I want, I, I feel like you can like, and this goes, I will say, Darren is right. He probably represents more of more traditional UX designers that are out there. And a lot of what, you know, the big companies and everything push. I, I understand that I am a, I'm going against the grain here. That felt like an insult I, and a praise at the same time. <laughs> oh, that's, no, no, that, there's, it's, it's, it's a matter of opinion. That's Steve's skill. That's Steve's skill. <laughs> he can insult like, you. You're, you're a great UX designer, but you're, you're, you think in the past, you're old. <laughs> you're a very conventional <laughs> thinker. I, but like my, my whole thing is like, I want to work qu quick and fast while still being like uh, diligent, right? And not, not skipping over the details. Is that I, I feel like like if you uh, it seems like in the the UX world, which you know um, a lot of people may not you know might not or, or I understand are not in that world, but I, the a lot of UX designers feel that if you know, when, when I say I like to work quick and fast, they assume like oh he's he's skipping steps, he he's not doing the the, the proper process and things like that. But it goes back with what I said um, earlier when I went on one of my one of my rants. Um, where it's just like you need to to find what works for you, um, and 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 like the 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 work that you're doing and who you're working with, um, and you need to adapt uh, that way. Um, and and for me, like what's always worked for me is like uh, work working quick and fast. I think there's a time and place for workshops, but I would be very I'd be very picky. I'd really think a lot about the value that the workshop is going to have and who is coming to it. Yeah. Um, well, well, I think, I, I think what okay, you're, I'll leave it at that. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I was going to say, I think what you're speaking to a little bit is like, not everything works for every person, which is kind of what we're talking about. Right. And cause I, I personally, I like a nice, a good workshop, but, um, but I also get that, you know, if somebody's, there's no sense of putting somebody through a workshop who's not going to get anything out of it. And there's no person of sending somebody to a conference who's not going to get out of it. There is a certain like who you are and how you learn or how you sort of take in the world is important in the process as well, which I think having more than one way of approaching UX maybe is, is the, uh, the, the solution, right? To, to, so that different people have <laughs> I see Steve yeah. wanting to talk. No, no, no. Oh, go, go on, Darren. No, I was going to say, and that's why I, I stress these design allies or um, advocates. Some people call them advocates, right? Um, I, I like design allies better. Um, but anyway, that's, that's, that's a tangent. Um, the, the point is, is that not everyone in the company, right? It could be a very small company or a startup, right? And everyone is the ally there. So that means everyone goes to the conference. Or uh, like in our case, like our company, right? It might just be me, Steve. Um, and then uh, two people like the CEO or uh, a few project managers, like it, get, it, it, and they're spreading the word from there. Um, it doesn't have to be everyone that goes to those type of things. And not every workshop is for everyone, right? There's a million workshops and a million different things. And I, I think Steve did hit it on the head there is taking the time to evaluate and research and see what things are needed for you, right? You might be in a healthcare space, right? So there's there's specific and a lot of like security things involved with that. There are workshops or conferences specifically for healthcare, right? Uh, that may help you more than general 
workshops where you get nothing out of it, right? Of uh, you may be a very uh, a big company, right? Where where I think agile excels, and you might need to go to more agile specific workshops. Doing lean workshops at that point is not really going to help you. So there's different things um, uh, for different people, um, and I agree with Steve uh, on that point. So what's what's yeah, the other know. side of this then? Oh, go ahead, Steve. Go ahead. I was going to say, when I, when I think of workshops too, I think not just like ones that are like, you know, kind of like a conference, but also workshops that take place in a company where you're bringing in like a, a bunch of people, maybe to work on a new feature or something like that. That's where, that's where I'm talking about is like, uh, for all, all this stuff I said was applying to. And, and then going back to Philippe, your point of like, you know, it sounds like what I was saying was like, it's like applying like a unique uh, or like a, a unique approach to each one of the, you know, based upon your own circumstances. Like, I just find it so ironic that um, UX designers, like that's their whole MO, right? And the yeah. work that you're doing is like, you, they have that user centric thought. Yet so many of us forget that when it comes to applying like UX disciplines in our craft and in our in our workspace and everything it, we're, we're so focused on like oh well google like i said earlier google does it this way facebook does it this way we need to do what like all the, the other ones are doing it's like no like apply your own ux logic to your circumstances it doesn't like you said philippe it doesn't just have to be in like software design right you can apply that type of thinking to just about anything yeah so what's the other what's the other side of this? We talked about like what are the best activities to foster, but what what kills a UX culture? Ooh, okay. I, I think to me, okay, it's research, communication, and iteration. Uh, those are the key words there for me. Those, those three things. If you don't have it, those three things, it it, it destroys it. And let, I'm gonna break it down more. I'm gonna break it down more. All right, right. Research, right. Um, doing plenty of research, right? Understanding how your competitors' uh, products work, understanding what your users are thinking, which uh, Steve has been preaching, um, is, a, is a real big part of uh, that kind of design thinking and that process and UX in general, right? If you're not doing that, even at the bare minimum, then that's already, that's going to kill the culture right there because uh, it's just not going to work, right? Communication, not communicating. We've been talking about it so much, right? But management, uh, design and devs, uh, we're talking specifically from a product perspective, right? And the big part of that is both management and design talking with development. If there's not enough communication between design and de development, no matter how good your design team is, it's still not going to translate into the product, right? Because the devs are not the designers, and some of them might have design skills, but they, they don't know what you're thinking, right? And, it, and just because it's on paper, they might not understand, or things can get lost in translation. So having that communication open is a big part of design thinking and collaboration and the feedback. And if that communication is not happening, then once again, it's going to kill the culture, right? And then iteration. And this is something I that happens a lot and it drives me insane uh, it, when people forget about this, right? Is iteration or thinking about the future. Uh, as in, remember, UX is an iterative process, uh, meaning you do not need to design the perfect products the first go around, right? You're, you're, it, it takes time, right? You get feedback, you understand, you know, you might have to go live and get that real user feedback to even make a better product. Um, so sometimes people get stuck, right? What you're designing was supposed to be the MVP, right? A minimal viable product, uh, which is where that comes from, that idea of that this is an iterative process, but then you end up making everything in the kitchen sink. Um, and then you put it out there and realize you didn't even need half of that. So you technically wasted time. Uh, so sorry, that, that really drives me insane. Uh, you really want to take the time to figure out what is your product? What do you need at this, at this time? What are we trying to push out from a business perspective and a user perspective? Focus on that. Move on. Phase two, phase three, phase four. It's never going to end. This is an iterative product. If you're making a digital product, it's not a one and done. This is a, it's a continual process. So just remembering that. And if you're not doing all those things or any of those things, I think it kills the culture. Yeah, I like I like what you said about the the iterative nature of it. Like you you say it. it well, I, I guess the one thing I would I would add, I agree with what you're saying, but I, the one part that isn't always true is like a lot of companies, um, and I've seen this firsthand. 
they it, it is not iterative and and then so like that that circumstance that you talked about where it's like the mvp and then scope creep happens and then that mvp has everything in the kitchen sink like it, that's that the reason why that happens in so in some circumstances and maybe it's it's from like people going from one job where it, it, you know the culture worked a certain way and then yeah. going to and then bringing what you know some of the bad experience and trying to learn from them and bring that over but what happens at a lot of places though is mvp ships and it, it is a legit mvp and then it's never touched again because you yeah. move on to the next feature yeah. and so what happens then is like oh we got to get everything into this because once we're done with this we're not touching it again in a year two years we don't know because yeah. usually the roadmap doesn't laid out that far it's just and that like, leads to a bigger conversation that leads to a bigger conversation which is another problem that i want to drag into this because i can talk for hours but yes i yes i agree that's a that's a good yeah. point um but i mean i mean i mentioned it earlier it's like other things that kill ux culture but you know going back to what i said before like having support from uh the you know executive team wh whatever that might be in your in your 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 job um that's important and not, not just like having having their buy-in but like i said their ability to enforce it because like yeah i i worked at places where like um you know i've been told like oh yeah we got we got buy-in from the very top and then um then you you over time you realize oh they, they say they buy in but then like you know then you see like other people that are underneath that person and how they're not they're ignoring ux essentially um and um i guess that uh yeah I guess, and one, one thing that goes into that too this is a little thing but um that that i think some ux designers will probably see and agree with but i worked at a lot of places where people say they buy in the ux but then they will they will praise the work that ux did by saying things along the lines like oh and we'll give this to the ux team and they'll make it look great that is the uh, ux designers a lot of them will take that as a backhanded compliment or like a, 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 as a, a way of saying that like that person doesn't understand what ux does because while yes like the visual design is part of the ux work that we do it is in that under that umbrella um that's not the only thing that we do and i think that's like one of the biggest things that i see in uh companies that are trying to integrate ux to be part of their culture is the they don't have they don't really truly understand what ux is yeah. and and so i don't know that I mean, this is a little thing you'll, but, you'll be um, happy to, steve you'll be happy to know that when i want things to look great i send them to darren i don't send them to you so you you don't have what to <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> shots fired i like you know, it. and it, it's funny when people ask what i do uh or like because it's very complicated sometimes to explain people uh, what a UX designer does or what they do. But I would like to say, uh, when I say what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, I say I, I spend 70% of the time thinking and 30% designing, right? Because really, to even make that design, you spend a lot more time thinking, researching, doing competitor analysis. Oh, is this, what, what are trends too? Trends are important, right? You don't want it to look outdated or you want it to match the branding. So all that takes time just to put one triangle on the um, screen so or one modal or drop down so um it's really a lot more thinking than it is designing yeah i agree with that but i guess the, the one other piece i wanted to add on to this that that kills ux culture um and this is like uh well i guess what it's ironic coming from me perhaps based upon what you think of me but uh <laughs> It, it also is like uh it's a it's a big it's a big thing and I'll, I'll go into some specifics but uh immaturity uh i think is a big thing and and by that i think that that goes not just that goes for designers that goes for everyone in a company um but like for designers specifically the one thing that i see all the time is designers not being able to take constructive criticism they they and and this comes from a lot of designers are very passionate about their work mm -hmm. Not saying that other disciplines aren't, but designers, a, a lot of them that I've worked with are very passionate about their, their work and they take it very personally. They view it as like a, an extension of them. And when, therefore, when they're asked to make changes to it, they don't take that feedback very well. Um, and, and, and they need to learn. I, I always tell des designers whenever 
um, I'm in a position to like to, to help them out, to, to help young designers out. Like if you cannot take, you need to learn to be able to take constructive criticism. And if you can't, you should probably find another, uh, another profession because it, it is very rare where you're going to get your design through the entire process um, and it come out looking exactly as you had originally designed. Um, and also too, like you're gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna gain information from talking to various people or like talk, not just users um, with like the user research that's gonna be conducted, just people that might have, if, you know, there's, there's, there's complex software out there, there's complex problems that, that you're not gonna be able to fully wrap your head around, whether it be like aerodynamics or medical or Phil, Philippe's favorite HR, there's gonna be things that you don't fully comprehend and you're gonna learn along the way that are gonna, that you will need to adapt to. And you will receive feedback along the way about why it needs to change. And you need to be open and receptive to that and be willing to change. Um, so yeah, I think that's the, that's like the main one I, I think that I wanted to, to hit on. Yeah. And I think um, what, you, what you mentioned, I think, cause I, I, I've definitely experienced the same thing in sort of marketing communications. I worked in video and all that. And a lot of times when building something for human consumption, um, the people who build it, my, I've done this for sure. You're attached to the art of it. And that art is very personal. Um, but art is different than uh, objective, right? And I think people forget about the, the end objective often, and they, they kind of hold on to this initial idea. And so to your point, in HR or in <laughs> wherever, um, holding too tightly to an idea and not um, being open to influence, it just sort of, I think, kills the process. So I, I like, I like the way that, um, that both of you all worded that. Um, okay. Let's talk about the team itself. Like how do you hire into a UX culture, um, to make sure that people are a fit into a UX culture? Um, for me, it's not really about skill. Right. Um, and when I, what I mean is, obviously if you're hiring ux designers but i'm taking this question as we're not specifically talking about a ux just a ux designer right how do you hire people for your company who buy in to it right so for me that means you're buying um motivated people uh you're you're uh oh, i mean not buying sorry <laughs> we're not buying people uh we're hiring <laughs> motivated people uh we're hiring people who can adapt right and who want to make an impact so and it's more of a personality thing right People who are motivated, who are passionate, I think fit well and type that uh, thing because that means they have input. I mean, that means every person matters and every one person can give feedback. So you don't really want people who are too quiet, right? Or even if they're quiet, they're not af uh, they're afraid to give feedback. You want people who can do that. You also want people not afraid of change. Is Things are going to change. That's a real big part of it is accepting change, uh, being able to adapt, move on, take feedback like... Uh, um, Steve said earlier and move on and then make an impact, right? Uh, which goes back to my point. Feedback is really big and important and that each person in a design thinking philosophy or UX culture can make an impact. And if you have people or you come across people who have that kind of personality or have said those things and that's really their, their skill set or part of their skills, then I think that is someone to take in mind and I think works well in a UX culture. Okay, I, I think that's that's good. Uh, one other thing that I think uh, in, in, that I think is important is when you're when you're interviewing candidates for a position, the make sure that they're talking to a variety of different people at the company. Maybe not just like you know if you're if you're whether you're hiring a UX person or an engineer, they should be interviewing with uh, everyone of different disciplines that they're going to be working with. So. Um, like for example, if you're hiring a UX designer, um, you they, you obviously want to talk, have them talk to the whoever the hiring manager is, the HR person, but also bring in like an engineer, uh, someone that they might work with on the day to day. Um, that can be a less formal uh, meeting if you're doing it in person. It could a lot of times this is done over lunch to see if they're a cultural fit, um, and then that that can sometimes like you know expose. Uh, a lot of things about that person. I, I, I've worked at a, some companies where uh, in, in one case, like we, are, we learn from 
we learn about a person and we decided not to make an offer to a person because of how they interacted with the receptionist at the, the company I worked mm. for. And it, it was just really interesting. It was just a conversation I was having at the end of the day. I was about to leave. We we're about to make an offer to this person. And then, you know, the receptionist was just saying like how rude this person was uh, to her. And I was just like, I, I took that back and you know, and we made a decision not to, you know, not, not to make an offer to that person. And I've been on the other side too, where, uh, you know, we, I've interviewed, a, a, it was another designer and uh, I liked the person, my, my manager liked the person. We thought this was like a no brainer hire, but then we went into the bigger meeting with like everyone, including the engineers that talked to this designer. And uh, they had a different perspective because like it turns out like, you know, a lot of people will put on a different face based upon who they're talking to. Sometimes they talk down to people because of their role or title in the company. And, and so that, that was another case where we didn't hire that person because that we thought was a no brainer hire, but we didn't hire them because they were not going to be a good cultural fit. Yeah. So I, I thought those were like, like interesting. And I just, I just say, I think that's important because I've been a part of like hiring panels where, the you only talk to the hiring manager and people that are like on that team and you're not that's not doing that's not making ensuring that that person's going to be a good cultural fit i feel like that's not that's not doing your due diligence due diligence excuse me yeah i i have this this theory and i'm sure that you all will likely agree maybe not steve steve never agrees with me but um and it's that like there are two buzzwords right ux is a buzzword and diversity and inclusion is a buzzword, right? And I always think, I've always felt like when you start solving for one, you start solving for the other, right? Mm -hmm. when, you, when, you, when you create a environment, a workplace that is, that, that is focused on design, focused on re research, uh, focused on, on solving problems from a user-centered approach, I mean, that's, you're also creating an environment that is more inclusive, right? And, and that, that's, it's one of those things that like when companies think about how to, again, I guess maybe I'm talking a little bit about HR, but um, when, when companies make like are trying to think of like what things to do to, to create the largest impact within their company, I think the UX sort of approach to um, thinking about, you know, their employees and thinking about how they want their employees to think is also, we use the word empathy. It's also the the one that utilizes empathy, which is at, also at the heart of diversity and inclusion. So I always, I always thought that those two things went really well together. Um, and it, that fits with our last talk about accessibility as well. Um, the last thing I wanted to say or ask is what about current employees? Let's say this is a new thing. We're trying to sort of switch over um, to this UX minded um, approach. And how do we get, we, we sort of talked about this, but how do we get newer employees, specifically maybe the ones that this is a little bit harder of a concept for them to grasp? How do we get them on board? And do they need to be fully on board? Can they still so, be beneficial if they're not? So um, I'm going to say it's a top down method, uh, which I think we've touched on a little. Um, it starts from the top down, um, executives buying into it and things like that. And uh, what I mean by that is, is more about inspiring than it is like dictating, right? Uh, and it means you're making it part of your company. So you're setting up spaces for collaboration, right? Uh, like for instance, here we have a Slack channel for feedback or we have uh, like um, um, Steve mentioned earlier, we have these things called donuts that allows us to talk and meet up and we play virtual golf sometimes. Like you're fostering one part of design thinking, which is collaboration and feedback right there. That's already solved, right? Um, you're, you're using tools like Maze or stuff like that, right? For your designers who need to reach out to people who are not design thinking and they don't have time to go through design files, right? But you need to get actionable feedback. So utilizing tools like that. Um, and then one of the big ones to me that I think our company does well and our CEO does well is in making it a part of your core values right um talking actually talking to your employees and letting them know why it's important and how it translates into sometimes revenue right because at the end of the day it's all a, it's a business right so if they see that it translates to more revenue which means better paychecks for you then you know it's kind of selfish but that 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 in turn will help people buy in and help become more 
of design thinking and buying some philosophy and then help build the culture. I'm glad I'm not the only one talking about money in this podcast. I thought I, I came off as kind <laughs> I mean, of this bad is, in the this, last one. Well, it's business, you know, Bus- money is always going to be important. Yeah. But uh, no, I, I, I yeah, I, I think Derek hit on a lot of the points that I had um, on this topic, but yeah, like, you know, having, you, you need to have the buy-in from the top, like I mentioned earlier. So whoever, if, if you can get it, the, the someone in the executive level, obviously it's not always going to be possible in like the onboarding process for a new employee. But um, you should have someone from the UX team, ideally like the UX manager or whoever is the head of that team. Like basically, you know, when the person's going through their, their onboarding and getting to talk to various people, have that person talk about their design philosophy and then have that reinforced by the person's manager. And like I said, the, if you can, to someone from the, the executive level, basically just and in, in reinforcing that it's not just this person saying that that's in a different team, that uh, this is something that is part of the culture of this company and, and what needs to be, what is expected to be done at this company. Um, I think that's important. Um, a lot of times, you know, if, if you're in a different department, the, your words may, may fall on deaf ears um, on some, some, some individuals, no matter how good your hiring process is, you're eventually going to encounter some people that don't have, that don't share the same values or um, that you want in, you know, for your company. So just making sure that they understand that, you know, everyone above them is looking to, for you to buy into this or, you know, I don't know, don't, don't, no threats needed or anything like that. Just have the, you know, the, the, the message is just enough to say that like, this is what, we expect from you. This isn't something that you can just go around. Nah, UX or else. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's the way to end it. UX or else. Um, well, thank you all for this talk. Um, I'm sure we could talk a lot longer on this, but um, I think we, we, we'll end it there. Um, this has been Speaking from User Experience, and we're signing off. We did it again, yep. Yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs>